Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. He is the current, one of the current counselors for Claire's Home, Alberta, Counselor Keith Carlson. Counselor Keith, welcome to the show. Good day. How are you? Not bad. Um, I guess I have to start off with the exact same way I've started off all my interviews with politicians, so you're no exception. Keith, where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? I think my sense of duty came from understanding that in a small community, there's a lot of volunteerism that has to happen. Um, and when you're in a position where you see some folks that are in municipal government to try to further an agenda for a small group, um, I, I, I went we were more worried about a town as a as a whole growing and there there were concerns back then and a lot of people had had said uh keith you're a a goofball that runs a restaurant in the middle of a a small town and you always seem to have an opinion and you always seem to calm the coffee table instead of ramp them up so maybe you should shut up and go on town council and in instead of uh appeasing the masses at at the local diner so so yeah i eventually stepped up and went it we we just need some calm level heads that get shit done what is what was it about municipal politics that drew you to it because there's a lot of times that people can give back whether it be like you said through volunteerism through nonprofit organizations but it wasn't until someone said okay it's time to put up or shut up keith let's why don't you run for council? What was it that was the initial factor for you? Because you talk about level head, but for you, there must have been something about the allure of municipal politics that you said, okay, I think I can do my best uh, duty and service to my community by getting involved pol uh, politically, municipally right now. Well, and that's exactly it. We had we had a few issues within town. We had a a stagnant um forward movement for a very long time uh when i moved to town we had and this is 20 years ago um the the movement of our community was that it was going to be a retirement community um and and it's it's timely uh we had a a, a mayor serve for a number of years who who just passed away a couple of days ago actually uh, and he'd done a good job of of maintaining a nice small community that seniors could retire in. And we've got great health facilities. We've got great hospitals. Um, but you get to a point uh, with the new economy that without a degree of scale, it's cost prohibitive to do anything within your community. Um, so the change in that mindset from from where we were to where I thought we needed to be in what I could, what I could assist with. Um, that's, that's what drew me into it. Um, with uh, the put up or shut up mentality of if we're going to build a new community uh, multi-center and a new town office, we've been waffling on it for 12 <laughs> years. Let's get it done in two years, right? There's, there's times where we can do as many studies as we want, and there's times where we can actually get people involved that get poop done. And I like to get poop done. I, I want to talk about, I'm going to talk about the pace of municipal politics here in a few minutes, but I want to stick to getting to know a little bit about uh, Councillor Carlson here for a few minutes. And I want to go back to that very first election for you, that very first election that you put your name on the ballot. Um, what did you learn about yourself during that election period? And I, I, I hate to ask because I, I try not to do a lot of research on my guests, but when was that first election for you? I'm sorry, what was? So the first question is, when was that first election that you put your name on the ballot for municipal politics? And the second question is, during that campaign period, what did you learn about municipal politics or yourself that you didn't know going into that campaign period? Well, in a community of 
3,500 people. Um, the the election and the the campaigning itself. I mean, it's it's a toned down version to to what you would expect in a ward system or anything like that. Um, but what I learned about myself is there's many, many people that are trying to do good things with different opinions. Um, and most of the time it's lived experiences that actually make those happen. So many people have many different lived experiences and those experiences um, create their judgment, um, whether it's sometimes a sheltered experience or uh, uh, an experience that is learned the hard way, so to speak. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's communities are always diverse. Even even with our little town, we've got we've got quite a diverse population. Um, and since my first election, much more diverse with some of the programs we've brought in with immigration and so on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very cool to go through that experience. And it's been, I'm on my second term. So we're five, almost six years ago, since I decided that I was going to, to put my name forward. Um, on on election night uh, five years ago, um, how much of a weight and responsibility did you put on your shoulders? Because the decisions you now make as an elected official are going to not only affect you, but are going to affect your community, your friends, your family, your uh, staff members at your work. How much of a responsibility did you put on yourself to make sure that the decisions you make not only are in the best of the future of the community, but the people who are there today. It's it's extremely important. Um, Do you still carry that today? Always. It, it's uh, we had our council meeting last night, and I one of my main focuses that I have is ensuring that the information that's brought forward is as concise as possible that the population understands what's going on and if not that we're we're available as a small town uh to be available to answer those questions and actually have the answers uh too many times you get uh, get folks that are on volunteer boards or community associations that show up for their board meeting once a month and it's it's a coffee club uh, and and you've seen examples of that within within town councils, not just Claire's own, but some of the other smaller communities I've lived in over my life, where it it definitely feels like um, we meet every couple of weeks. We discuss what administration's doing, and as long as nobody's rocking the boat, everybody continues to to stay status quo. Um, that's a challenge for me. Um, I, why do you say that? Like why, 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 <laughs> why don't you like, why don't you like status quo? Because it seems like municipal politics is all about status quo, trying to keep everyone happy, trying to keep everything running smoothly, but you're saying, no, I don't like that. I like sort of pushing the envelope a little bit further. Well, so my background comes from, from being in a position where I, uh, I, I started out moving moving away from home at 17 and I had what was in my 78 Chrysler Newport uh, and that's that's where I come from um, so I've I haven't gotten without doing for my entire life um, and what we've done between myself and my my spouse Brandy um we've got we've we've developed a nice little business where we're we're doing okay we're not uh um a global superpower by any means of, of the imagination but but we we make people smile um in a community that has a a smaller population uh 
we've all seen what inflation has done over the last number of years and the ebb and flow of oil and gas, and especially in our area, gas. Um, everything's been more or less um, explored in the area. We're not going to get that traffic back. Uh, so we've got a choice of staying as a rural farming community um, and what that limitation is, or we diversify in order to hopefully gain population base, gain industry, and and ensure that it's a viable community. Um, you've got the ability to invest in your community, and and you're not in a position where you in 20 years your main street is gravel because you can't afford to pave the roads uh and and we've seen communities go that way and i mean that used to be the 800 to 1200 population communities that that could no longer sustain and and it's going to get to the 3500 and, and 5000 population communities that that have those challenges as well so uh I see I see what's happening in the distance and by by looking to the past and understand uh, there needs to be a little vision as well. So how do you bring that vision in there? Because your vision for the community is going to be completely different than the vision of anyone else in your community. If I go talk to 100 people in Claire's home tomorrow, they're all going to have different visions. So how do you rectify your vision against the visions of others because you're there to represent everyone but they've elected you to say okay we believe in your vision go ahead with your vision but how do you also uh, compare your vision with other visions and say maybe i'm doing this wrong maybe i should look at jim's uh, vision a little bit in depth and then sort of merge my vision with his vision and then Sarah's vision down the street. So how do you ensure that the vision of Claire's home in the future is always going to be the vision that everyone wants and not just the current counselors want? It comes with humility. <laughs> uh, uh, understanding that, that it, uh, my poop stinks just as much as anybody else's. So I've got, I've got the ability to say, you know what, I could be wrong and, and, and have my ears open. Okay. That you, you've opened Pandora's box now, counselor. I have to play in Pandora's box for a little bit here. You've just, Feel said, you've just said a word that I've never, I've heard the very off, not very often when it comes to talking to uh, politicians wrong, I can be wrong. Have you ever gone into a council meeting knowing your mind is made up thinking, okay, this is how I'm going to vote on an issue. I've read the report from administration and then you've heard a public hearing and go, oh, I didn't think of it that way. I was wrong in my thinking. I need to switch my vote because municipal politics is such a unique beast. I find that politicians are the sort of the pulse of the community. They know what their community wants, but sometimes they can be swayed it unlike provincial and federal politics. So for you, have you ever gone into a meeting going, Nope, I'm no, I'm right on this one. And then go, Oh crap, I am wrong on this. And Sarah down the street just told me why I'm wrong with this. So I'm going to change my, my perceived vote, even though you're supposed to be an open mind until you get to the council. Some people read reports and I've, interviewed many counselors who have read reports and made up their minds before anything is even done. So for you, how much humility do you place on yourself to make sure that, you know what, sometimes I know I'm going to get it wrong and I'm glad that I have residents here who are engaged and willing to tell me I got it wrong. Uh, I can count on both hands how many times I've had to go. <laughs> I, I, I have my head up my arse. Um, really? it's, okay. it's, we've all got preconceived notions about what we think things are. Um, but facts and information are a hell of a lot more important to me than what people perceive me to be. So if somebody is in a position where, where we're going into, into, a talk about a uh, community center development or 
or a park issue, all these things that come through, or my my favorite is our our water rates. Um, we're one of the first communities to to actually go to a full recovery model on on uh, our water and sewer rates. Wow. Uh, so it 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 quite contentious over a three year period to to take and include your depreciation and and amortization into your water rates to show it live on a water bill um which can be quite alarming i know my my restaurant bills every every so often during the summer i i i was was and still am a huge proponent of that system because we know provincially we're not we're not going to see the days where you can run a, a municipal water system into the ground and expect a 20 million dollar check from the province to build you a new a new plant it's it's not viable anymore so that self self sustaining model is important to us person well important to me personally and and has proven very valuable over the last three years that we can actually go eighth avenue's water system is due for this is the really important part of municipal politics is you run a restaurant at the same time and every so often have to say say hi and and hi. and have a have a check to one of the suppliers go out the side door as you're as you're chatting um so... i, I, I want to jump into the question about issues because you, you bring up a good point about always trying to move the community forward but the days, like you said, the days of getting a big giant check from federal or provincial government are gone. I think that a lot of people are uh, in that mindset today that government is not the best uh, indicator of how much a community is going to grow. So I want to know from you, how do you balance that, though? Because if, again, if I go survey your community right now, every single one of them is going to have one particular issue that's very important to them. Whether it be a pothole in front of their house, whether it be a sidewalk that's not uh, 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 paved, uh, cemented correctly, whether it be a park that's run down, everyone's going to have their issue. And you as counselor and as a council will have to decide who the winners and the losers are. Because Jim is not going to get his sidewalk paved today, but it may happen two years from now when you have the money to pave that area or fix that area. So how do you as counselor balance that? Because you want the best for your community, but you have to also understand that money doesn't grow on trees and municipal governments have to run uh, balanced budgets at the end of the year. So you can't choose every single uh, issue that every resident wants. So how do you balance that? Because I can imagine saying no as a counselor is probably the hardest thing you've had to learn. Well, saying no as a counselor is a face-to-face -face issue, right? So uh, you, you, you're able to say no to Jim on his sidewalk as you're walking on the sidewalk with him. Um, and some will find that difficult to be able to to have to look somebody in the eye and go, I, I understand your concern, and we if we we work on a priority based uh, budgeting program, and every municipal government now has to have their three and five year uh, uh, financial plans in place. So you're here. And we can we can show you on on our five year plan that Jim, I'm sorry, but you're it looks like your sidewalks six to eight. But we can go for a drive and I'll show you Billy's sidewalk and you'll understand why. Do people uh, do you, people are are people open to that? Are people open to the idea that okay, maybe my ideas, maybe maybe my sidewalk's not the uh, is cracking, but 
Bob's is. And okay, as much as I would love mine to be fixed today, his needs to be fixed yesterday. Yeah, I I still pay taxes and I want the cuz. Um and and rightfully so. I mean I I've got I've got a low spot that dips right at my driveway and I've got an, a little icy section right at the corner of, of my sidewalk every year as well. And you can find somewhere on my Facebook, the picture of me going, uh, well, it was, it was a great capture of the security camera outside the house. Uh, I, I looked very stellar, uh, <laughs> but it's, the fact is that we do have to say no and communities like ours that that may be behind the eight ball as far as what we thought development needed to be or where taxation had to be in order to maintain what what is coming up um a lot of communities are are on a 40 50 year um need uh deficiency <laughs> there's 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 no way they're ever going to catch up on on make making things hit their their best life life cycle um because we we tried to be as kind as possible as far as taxation rates and didn't want to didn't want to burden the community and figured that we'll be able to find some free money from some level of government other than ours further down the road. And that's not saying that municipal government has the ability to tax the hell out of our, our citizens and, and catch up. Um, but there is, there is that need to recognize that you still have to, you still have to run the beast, right? Municipal politics is the frontline politics of politics. You are in your community at all times. You're not in Edmonton and Alberta. You're not in Ottawa if you're federally. You are in your community at all times. Now, you're a unique uh, counselor in it yourself as well because you're a business owner. And as a business owner, you are you own a restaurant and you have people come and go all the time. How do you balance your personal life, your business life, and your council life? Because I've spoken to many counselors across this great country, and I hear all the time that council jobs are 24-7. There's no off time for you. You go to pick up your groceries, you're getting asked questions. You go uh, sit down at a restaurant, you're getting asked questions. How do you balance that lifestyle? Um, there can be challenges. Uh, for the most part, we've been fairly lucky over the last number of years because our first four years, I, I believe, were pretty successful in in making things happen, and and we had some great projects go on. Um, we had some great wins, uh, so uh, you could walk into the grocery store and not get cornered to ask why X isn't happening. Um, currently, with our with our council, um, the economics of things aren't super rosy you've you've got a lot of folks that are are questioning what next steps will be um people are personally struggling so it's a much more fine tooth comb that you may have to walk through once in a while um i've had had lots of discussions in the uh, produce aisle at the at the grocery store answering a few questions of things that people may not have the full knowledge on but being truthful with folks and just giving them the information and a lot of times i leave conversations with going i i understand you're not happy with it but now at least you know the truth behind why and i'd rather give you the truth behind why than excuses are people open to hearing that? Are people open to hearing what you have to say? Because I, I I rant and rave about 
social media, how it's always a one-sided conversation on social media. Until you actually sit face to face, and this is where the show comes in, you don't know the full story. You don't know both sides. You just you're not able to ask the questions. Are people when they're in that situation, when you're telling them the tr- what you how you did it and what the truth is, are people open to hearing that side of the story like they aren't on social media from time to time? Well, 95 percent of the time. Yeah. They, I mean, to have a face to face and actually have a conversation and and not just bang your drum. Um People, people are willing to listen because they know you're being open with your conversation and I, I, communication skills have a lot to do with it. I mean, if I, if, if somebody turned around and said, I don't, I don't like the fact that my, my uh, garbage rates went up by a dollar 50 this year. Uh, and I told them to suck it. Um, chances are they're not going to be hugely happy. Um, when I can turn around and go, we looked at that 14 different ways and we had this option and this option and we looked at privatization and privatization would have cost you an extra $500. Um, so I think we're doing pretty okay keeping those jobs within the community and it only went up a buck 50. Um, you can be grumpy with me for a buck 50, but it, it I managed to still, <laughs> I, I managed to save you four hundred four hundred and ninety eight dollars and fifty cents. So, um, uh, I can I can be happy with that, and you can be pissed off with that, and that and and we're going to be okay. Uh, but that's that's kind of the role with it, and then that life balance that that equates with it. I mean, yeah, there's there's days I've got I've got a daughter that's got some, uh, she's got a neurological disorder. Um, a son with As- Asperger's. So they're very high functioning and they're doing great, but there are, are times where where it's a family first situation and you've got to look at people and go, I, I, I appreciate your concerns, but you're going to have to come to the restaurant and have a chat with me on Thursday if you actually want to and not be afraid to to say, uh, counsel, counselor being a counselor shouldn't be a 24 seven job. And my opinion is if your mindset is that you're either, you're either in a position where you inflate your worth um, and, and think that you're King poop of Turd Island or, or you don't know how to manage your time. Uh, so true that, that, that that's that's kind of where it falls i mean i i could say that yeah i between my business my my home life and my council life i there might be days where i'm i'm working 18 hours a day um but that's a choice for a day not a lifestyle i want to turn to my next uh, topic and that is the uh, the town of claire's home itself And before I ask this question, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between myself and the counselor. This is not a decision by counsel. This is not a motion at counsel. This is his opinion. And he's talking to the host of the cross border interviews. Um, Counselor, in your opinion, right here, right now, as of recording, what is the biggest issue you believe that is facing the town of Claire's home? Uh, Economic development. Um, that's honestly kind of been my big project for a number of years and we've sat I've, I've sat on ECDEV for a number of years um we as a community of this size have unique challenges that larger centers may not um like what it comes uh, it comes down to being able to actually grow from your current borders. We've got a community that, that for the most part is developed to its edges. We've got a few, few cool things that are happening this year. We've got potential for some new residential and so on and so forth. But when it comes down to the brass tacks, when you've got somebody that sees this, cool community in between Lethbridge and Calgary and and on the highway to a corridor and it's got 
everything that that they need and we've got sustainable water and and i can go on about 200 other awesome things that our community actually has going for it oh we're gonna get to that part of the topic soon (laughs) (laughs) then we get to the and we're almost there we've got asps on land we just don't have ownership of the land so if you can make a deal with a landowner and you can guarantee us that you've got that land then we can possibly go ahead and get the deep infrastructure into a road if we can get a borrowing bylaw and da 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 so when you've got communities this size and this is what i advocate advocate for provincially is that we've got that ability to take on low or no interest provincial money to to take us to that next step where you've got all of all of these asks going on and you've got 80 million dollars worth of of development potential come through your community that you can't fulfill because a community that has an eight million dollar debt load needs four million dollars to put deeps services into an area to actually accommodate those jobs that would diversify the tax base right so between between having the need for that development and understanding that 80 percent of our taxation is on the residential side of things versus the industrial and commercial you put a large burden on an aged population that we we created ourselves over the last 40 years. Um, So this doesn't sound like an easy fix, though. This doesn't sound like an easy fix because, uh, and I'm not trying to throw Claire's home under the bus here, but a lot of communities are facing this issue as well, right? A lot of smaller uh, uh, urban communities, I should say, Um, rural rural communities, however you want to say it. you uh, you have an aging population, which is understandable. Alberta's rural communities are aging. How do you fix it, though? Because there's a lot of people who are going to say, okay, I understand that's an issue, but how is the city, uh, how is the town of Claire's home trying to address this? Because you're not going to flick a switch and everything's going to be going Claire's home's way tomorrow. So how do you, as councillor, move this file forward? Well, I, I, I flash my wonderful smile and I, I show a little leg. Um, it, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that it is, it is a, a circular argument that goes on for days and days. And it's a circular ar- argument that goes on within council and administration as to what risk are we willing to take on a non-tangible return on the investment so if 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 we're in a position where where you've either got you've either as a municipality have to bite the bullet and and purchase land and put in in deep infrastructure and market something that could sit there for 25 years and do absolutely nothing and actually become a burden on on your taxpayers. Um, Or you choose to wait for a private investor to come into your community and do it for you. Um, My experience as both a business person uh, coming from a family background in, in, uh, uh, residential development and and trades there is very very few people and investors that will actually walk into a community with with uh, nothing underneath their roads and say sure I'll uh, I'll put I'll put the infrastructure under the roads we'll we'll make a deal that you pay us back over the next 20 years and I'm going to do X development. Um, it doesn't fit into their development plan. And it's hard to invest in somebody that's not willing to invest in themselves. 
right? So to change that thought pattern from waiting to see who will come and and do it and and who will take risk. Um, very few investors will take risk on somebody that's not willing to risk on themselves. Do you think as a municipal council and a municipal councilor, you have to be more proactive in your thinking than reactive? Because we always fix the pothole that got uh, broken. We always fix the water main break that's always uh, that we didn't expect to uh, break. But in your thought process about economic development, do you think it needs you need to be more proactive in your thought process? And how hard is it to be proactive when municipal councils always are dealing with the here and now and not the 10 years from now? It is more than a challenge. Um, and, and it comes down to the knowledge base of your decision makers as well, right? Um, if you've got, uh, you've always got an ebb and a flow of what, what come, comes in as that knowledge base within a, a town council. And, and a lot of times um, the desires change. Um, you'll have four years of people that really want one project done. They come in, they are, they enable one project to get done. They're happy. They leave. Um, and beyond a desire for that project to happen, a, a knowledge beyond said project, they've got no interest in what's actually going on. They could give a crap about your pothole. Um, because they they wanted new swings at a park and they got their swings and they're happy and 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 that's pretty awesome they, they've got to win um, I came into council not because I wanted something I thought I had something to offer and we've got a few folks on council that that's exactly how we approach it is I have a skill set I've been a business owner. I've been a restaurant guy. I, I, I really like my numbers and I'm quite analytical in how I approach things. So I'm not making my decisions usually off of an emotional basis of, of why I want X. Um, I'm, I look at it as what's good for our community and what our people are asking for. Uh, so it's not hard to steer, steer that conversation. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely a challenge. We, we talked to, we talked earlier on in the interview about the speed of municipal politics because we often say that federal and provincial politics run out of snail's pace. Sometimes municipal politics could even be slower because as we've mentioned, you have to do study. You have to make sure everything's good. You have to go to a report. You have to do first, second, third by uh, reading of a bylaw or a policy. Yes, they can take uh, sometimes uh, they can be quick. Sometimes they can be slow. In your time in office, was that the biggest challenge for you to overcome is how sometimes slow municipal politics or municipal government can be because you might have to wait for administration to get back to you. It may not be the top priority. It might not be the first thing that's on their list that they have to get done. How how have you been able to adapt of at the speed of municipal politics when it comes to solving issues for your community? It, again, there's challenges. <laughs> um, do you think it's been especially, it's, it's come a long way since you first got elected, though? Because now that you understand the role and you understand it a little bit better, do you think it's come a long way, or do you still think it's the? And I'm not saying that I'm not trying to not, yet again not trying to beat up on Claire's home administration because I'm assuming they're fine people. I'm just saying that yeah. all municipal pol uh, governments are often very slow. And and yes, it will go. We'll go back to our town office municipal building that 
was delayed for about 12 years because nobody would make a decision. Uh, when my first term we got on, um, we had had a CAO who, um, Miss Marion Carlson, uh, she left our, our, our town on her retirement as CAO of the year uh, through Alberta municipalities. An absolute amazing woman with huge knowledge uh, who I still bug once in a while. And if you ever want someone to interview that that has a great insight and the ability to work around situations, there is a woman that I respect um, more than myself. It's uh, she, she's amazing. Uh, but the first the first question came up is the town office has been what a lot of folks have run on. Um, we've got a daycare that's involved in this situation. What information do you need? Do you need another study and so on and so forth? What do we have available for us now? Well, here's the first study, here's the second study, and here's the third study. At which point I said, and we had a number of conversations go back and forth and it's like, you've got three documents that all say we need to proceed with a degree of urgency. Um, it was an 80 some odd year old uh, ex hospital that um, it was at the point where it started to have the smell of, of don't put any more money into me. Uh, so <laughs> never heard a building described that way, but I'm using it from now on. <laughs> as, as my old man was a plumber, there were many days as a volunteer with the daycare board where once in a while on a Saturday, I'd be in there fixing a couple of things that no longer worked quite properly uh it there were challenges um so it it came down to i i finally said it's it's time we we poop or get off the pot so either we're voting to go ahead with this or we're not doing it at all and it goes right off the radar but make a decision one way or the other and it wasn't really a decision to be made it was just it was just a matter of somebody saying let's get this done get it done, move forward. Um, and there's many, many items within communities where you know what has to be done. People are afraid of either being disliked, not getting reelected, um, whatever their motivation is. And for the four years that you've got me, my job is to make the best decision, whether it's popular or not popular. Um, and it has nothing to do with with whether you call me an arsehole and, and come in throwing paper at me and at the restaurant. Um, it has to do with the fact that there's something that needs to be accomplished. And they're not always fun decisions to make. I want to go back to that town hall decision here for a second because you bring up a good point because sometimes municipal councillors always forget that the city hall is an important infrastructure building for the day-to-day -day operations of the city hall, but they can also look at it as a frivolous spending uh, purchase because you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, we have this building already. Why are we buying, building a brand new one when we have the infrastructure already in place? So we could be spending this money on X, Y, and Z compared to making ourselves look better. And the people of our community may see this as a frivolous, not needed expenditure. And I know there's a lot of municipalities right now who are going through this exact same discussion where they're building a city hall or a new town hall because their old one has aged out. Things get old, things get decrepit. So for you, is looking at the bigger picture and not always worrying about the vocal minority on social media important as well? The bigger picture is always what you have to look at. I mean, even if it's, yes. even if it's for the betterment of just the staff and the administration and the facade of what city council looks like, is that, is that important as well? 
I'm just getting to this whole town hall issue because I think your community yeah. is such a unique one because I'll be honest, I, like I said, I try not to do a lot of research, but I've seen the attacks that you've gotten over the town hall purchase. I saw one <laughs> or two of them. I'm like, why are people upset about this? A town hall is the imp most important building in an administration's bucket. Like that's where people come in. They see your community and they know what your community is about. And when I saw it, I just I was a little taken back by the attacks that you were getting. I was like, this doesn't seem like a big issue. If that's the biggest issue in their life right now. Mm. If you've done some of the research that was was there, and I, my 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 wife still has a, a a little sticker on the back window of her car that was vote for uh, by law fifteen seventy four. I think it was. Um, we were in a unique position that. Um, within that building itself, we had a daycare, a preschool. Um, now, if you can imagine um, a hospital that back in the day thought it was a great idea that a hospital have about 10 or 12 cement steps to get up into it. Um, that's, that's the age that we're looking at. You've got kids that were in a position where there was some mold issues. Uh, when, when I had my kids in preschool, uh, well, and, and previous to that, when I moved to town, um, in 93, 95, uh, when my parents moved here and I was still, um, uh, a young man, um, that was the talk that the daycare would only be there temporarily. Um, so we moved out of that in 2020, 21, somewhere in there, uh, into that facility. So for, for almost 30 years, we were in a position where kids would go down, uh, cement steps from the outside of the building into the basement of this old hospital, uh, for, for preschool and, and yeah, it was a musty old basement. Um, you had you had walls falling apart in a daycare. All of these things that we grandfathered in so so long that that your uh, your uh, managing bodies in Alberta Health and all of that would go. Yeah, we understand it's slated for, so we'll accept it up until um, it comes down to that eventually you've got a pooper get off the pot and we we did a lot of community involvement and open houses and um yes i'm i'm sure you looked back and saw we had had some definite challenges with uh, a counselor that that was there and we had we had it sounds like it's been a fun uh two terms for you on council it's it was a ro rocky ride to start but I'm proud of what we've done. Uh, and, and that's what it comes down to. We've got an awesome daycare. We've got an awesome preschool right next to our, our elementary school and, and our, our after cool school care, uh, things that'll be there for the next 50 years that, that wouldn't have happened if we didn't actually stand up and say, it's, it's time for action. Um, and, and having a council that's willing to stick their neck out and say, I honestly don't care whether you vote for me in the next election or not. You gave me a mandate to do a job. This is what you wanted done. Um, we've accomplished it. I'm a numbers guy that is, I started a restaurant with $5,000 in my pocket and have managed to hold on to it for 15 years. I'm going to be as, as critical of myself in my actions as I would for my business, because I know what it's like to lose everything or have nothing. And I refuse to do that to my community. That's important to me. And, and I think because of that, I've, I, I feel like I've got a degree of trust within the community and they know that I'm, I'm a straight shooter and not going to sell snake oil. Um, I want to turn to my last topic, and this is my favorite part of the interview. 
As we have listeners from across Canada and around the world, I like talking about tourism because, A, I'm a tourist myself, and I like to go to these different communities and find the hidden gems in the communities. But also I've heard from people who have listened to the show that they like hearing from councillors and politicians about what their favorite spots are. So for you, councillor, for you, Keith, what are the hidden gems within Claire's home that, as a tourist, you need to check out, you need to do when you're there? Claire's home's awesome. Um, a lot of people, we, we struggle we, we struggle with an identity within Claire's home because it's, it's one of those communities that has everything but doesn't have a... a, a great attraction for come for x all right so it's it's that community that kind of fits everything it's one of those places you move to because you you show up and you go huh i didn't realize this town had an indoor pool and and has have all these amazing pathways and had a had some overland flooding which turned into uh, uh cool um storm ponds that are now lagoons and wildlife and and 18 hole golf courses and and all of these little things that you just don't see uh but when you when you're driving through town and you go ah what's that big building over there and you realize every weekend you've got two or three hundred people at the agriplex with whatever uh uh horse event is in in town you've got a downtown that has a lot of cool little coffee shops and and mom and pop shops um, that you don't see if you don't come off the highway. Um, that's what I like about our community. Um, we're currently just finishing a about a four year program with Amundsen Park, um, so we 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 just got a a full redevelopment with some beautiful gazebos and stage areas. And it's going to, it's going to be awesome for our, our uh, uh, garden markets and our farmers markets this year. Uh, but one of the huge gems that, that I love is right across the parking lot from my restaurant is our old train station. We've got a beautiful sandstone train station. Um, that's our, our local museum. And Mr. Bill Kells has been, been, running it for a number of years and um you can uh check out we just had a, a news story done on it with our flight simulator um and a veteran that was one of the the folks that actually trained at our airport for uh, the old harvard uh british uh, training center um so you could actually go in there and run a flight simulator and it's pretty awesome but that ties into my favorite spot in all of Clarezone because I like some quiet I deal with a couple hundred people a day at the restaurant and two teenagers so if especially if I've got to take a teenager for a driving lesson I drive out to the airport and you've got um the old location because uh, I'm a restaurant guy I'll geek out on on Miss Jean Hoare you can do some some research on on her world famous restaurant that was out at our airport that you had uh, um Hollywood elite would actually fly into Claire's home to eat at Jean's restaurant um so you've got an old World War II training facility with all of the now well-aged uh hangars and buildings and the old streets and you can walk the old streets where the where the uh barracks and so on and so forth used to be and it's just it's got some awesome things happening and one of the only drifting racing sites in in western canada so uh uh rocky mountain racing I might get that wrong, and I apologize if I do, but uh, you can come out on the weekends and watch drift racing um, out at the airport, and it's 
there's all sorts of fun things. And then we'll get into Willow Creek Park and nature and being a half hour away from some of the best mountain trails you'll see. Uh, it's it's the town that's right in the middle of nothing that has everything and access to all. So, yeah, I, I kind of like my town a bit. I have been to your community twice. I've driven through once and I've stopped in once. Um. I didn't know about this stuff. And this is what I find fascinating. We always talk about the the, the 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 staples of tourism when it comes to Alberta, like Jasper, Banff, but we never tell these stories. And I've just learned so much about your community within two seconds, within like that 30 second uh, statement that you just gave that I want to come back to your community and I want to see all and experience all these things now. So thank you so much for giving me the, the, like sort of a, a better insight into your community. And now I know where I'm stopping when I come through in, the, in about two, three months, once the weather warms up. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, my last question for you here, Keith, is this, what makes uh, Claire's home such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Unique? I don't know if it is unique. How's that for an answer? That is a uh, um, an interesting answer coming from a counselor. Like I said, it's got a little bit of everything in the middle of everything with access to everything. So, I mean, it it. I guess what's unique about about the community itself is it's that place that you come to and expect very little from. Because you drive through and it's like, oh, it's just a, a small town that you drive through. And uh, there's some, we're working on on some older buildings that are no longer occupied or occupied, but unkept. And it, there's, it, it doesn't have the best curb appeal at, at times. But once you turn off that road and you, you pull up at Ruth's Flower Shop and walk in and you're like, wow, this is here. Um, and you walk down the street and you hit um, Blackwood Coffee and you're like, oh, that's probably the best uh, London Fog I've had ever. Uh, the, I've heard they have the best it. cinnamon buns in town. I heard there's a certain restaurant that has the best cinnamon buns that is always promoted on Twitter. They're... Okay, I wasn't gonna honk my own horn. Oh, yes. honk your horn! Honk your horn! <laughs> uh, so yes, we are the we are the cinnamon bun capital of Canada, maybe North America at this point. Um, where we've been on, you've got to eat here. We've been featured on many different things. We just started doing a frozen product that we actually shipped to the door. Um, I just sent our first order out to a suburb of Ottawa that'll be there tomorrow morning for Mr. Belichick, and he will be baking his wife's fresh cinnamon buns uh, out in Ottawa. He's an RCMP officer that used to be here, transferred out there, so his wife and kids haven't had a Roy's Place cinnamon bun for five years. They're smiling. I'm going to be smiling later on this year when I come and I actually stop in for one of these famous, famous cinnamon buns. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but also I might even just get on the mailing list so that way I can buy one so you can send it to me and then I could do it here as well. Um, well, here's, here, here's one quick story for you before everything goes, because we had an amazing group in on the weekend. Gentleman comes through. He's wooing a young lady. He thinks to himself, how am I going to make the first move? He ends up buying one of our memorable cinnamon buns uh, so he can take it to her work. Um, on the 12th, it is their their one-year anniversary. They showed up on sat Saturday or Sunday um, because the bun helped seal the deal. Uh, so, so our buns were memorable, but his butt made it happen. Um, and, and we, we've only had two marriage proposals in the restaurant over, over breakfast. So if we can get one more over our cinnamon buns, I, I think we've hit the trifecta and, and the world will be a better place. Counselor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me. This has been an enlightening, I know I said 45 minutes, but we're close to an hour. So it has been an enlightening 
hour conversation with you about yourself, about the town of Clarisome. Thank you so much for doing this. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate my town. So thank you, Chris. Um, So with that, I want to remind everyone, get off social media, put down your phone and go talk to someone, have a conversation with somebody helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.